Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the nice introduction and good afternoon. Uh, before I get started in my presentation, I just want you to know uh, who you are. Uh, so please raise your hands. Physicians? Okay. Um, what else? Uh, pharmacists? Nurses? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, drug development scientists? Okay. That's good. Mostly uh, this room is filled with uh, clinicians, physicians. Um, well, I think this is a tough topic <laughs> to go over, but I'll do my best. Um, extrapolation uh, across indications is very, it's a simple idea. In other words, you study a drug in just one indication and then extrapolate or generalize its intended indications to other indications that I haven't even tested, but for which the original uh, reference product was indicated for, okay? And then why does it matter? Because extrapolation of indication has been around with us for many, many years, particularly in the area of small molecule-based generics. But, um, well, actually, um, I, I just want to show this slide first. The thing uh, that we are discussing today is not a simple small molecule-based drug, it's biologics, and it's biosimilars. And it, biosimilars are similar or highly similar to a particular biologic, which is a reference drug or reference product, they are not the same. In, in other words, as you can see in this slide, all snowflakes has six sides, but if you look at those under microscope, then you will realize that they are different, right? So when it comes to biologics, they are similar. That's fine. But if you look at um, each biologic, they are slightly different, particularly um, post-translational modifications, which are represented mostly uh, by glycosylation and other type, uh, types of conjugation. And that kind of post-translational uh, modification has something to do with uh, its intended effect and efficacy. So why don't I go back to my previous slide. Um, so uh, with Dr. Hong uh, very eloquently introduced how Remsima was uh, developed and approved, uh, which is a great thing, I think. Uh, I'm really proud of being uh, part of this uh, nation uh, because South Korea is, is the world leading uh, country uh, for uh, biosimilar development, particularly monoclonal antibody-based uh, biologics. Anyway, uh, Remsima, uh, a biosimilar to uh, Infleximab, or Remucate, was studied primarily in the area of rheumatoid arthritis. But it was, uh, the regulatory agencies such as U uh, European Union's uh, EMA, South Korean uh, FDA, formerly, but now it is MFDS, uh, and even US FDA were happy with the extrapolation of indications across dif different indications, although Remsima was tested primarily in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Health Canada were not quite happy uh, initially, but my understanding is that they eventually allowed uh, this kind of indication extrapolation. Uh, so if you look at uh, the um, Influx map uh, original, was indicated primarily for uh, rheumatologic disease and also IBD or inflammatory bowel diseases. And Health Canada were not happy with that kind of indication extrapolation, so initially they did not grant uh, extrapolation uh, indication. Well, actually, I'm a big fan of extrapolation. Uh, I'm a drug development scientist, uh, particularly in the area of clinical pharmacology. And if you look at a whole lot of different kind of uh, drug development, they are all extrapolation. You, you study just one group, but you eventually use that drug to other uh, patient groups as well. For example, a study uh, uh, is only performed in adults, but uh, but eventually, you will use that medicine in pediatric patients as well, right? So, indication extrapolation. Extrapolation is everything about what makes drug development quite unique. But when it comes to the extrapolation of indication for biologics, when uh, Remsmo was proven and granted for extrapolation, I did some kind of scientific research. Uh, AI, I understand that every country has its own discretion, I mean, its own uh, jurisdiction, s sovereignty, so they can approve 
or grant, whatever they want to do. But as a scientist, particularly a clinician and clinical pharmacologist, I just want to know on what basis this type of extrapolation can be granted, on what basis. So I wrote this uh, article. Uh, it was published actually 2013 and has been well received by the, the community. Uh, I mean, the number of citations ha uh, has been more than 60. Uh, and I think, uh, I don't think uh, the reason why this article has been well received was that I wrote this article very, very nicely. No, uh, that, that I don't think. But primarily because I think I was the first one who actually scientifically challenged the idea of extrapolation indication in this field. Anyway, my idea is, was extrapolation of indication is possible if and only if the following three criteria uh, conditions are met. Number one, sensitive clinical model. Number two, the same mechanism of action or uh, the same uh, receptors for extrapolated indications. For example, rheumatology, IBD, if they are involved the same, uh, same receptor, uh, in the case of ramucimab and TNF-alpha, it's okay. Three, which I think is the, the most the significant one, the safety and immunogenicity profiles have to be sufficiently characterized. So, based on this idea, I just followed up um, uh, uh, Remsima was, uh, was okay to meet uh, all of those criteria. Number one, what do I mean by a sensitive clinical model? Sensitive, being sensitive means that if there is a difference that should be detected, that's a, that's a sensitive model, right? And particularly in the area of extrapolation, the greater the placebo-adjusted efficacy of the reference, the easier, the more, uh, more easier the difference between the reference and its biosimilar can be detected. What do I mean by that? Look at this graph. Okay, let's assume that there is a 20% significant difference between a reference and its biosimilar, okay? What if indication A, the placebo just response is 50? Well, you don't need to worry about what unit I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. So 50 is, is the difference between um, on the active drug and placebo in, in indication A. That means that if, if reference drug has 60 efficacy, placebo has only 10, so the difference is 50. So if there's a significant difference of 20% between the reference and its bisimilar, the difference is going to be translated into 10, which can be rather easily detected, either greater or lower. But what if, in indication B, there is only five difference, in other words, the, uh, the placebo just difference is only five, and then that translates into only two or negative two, where in this case, it's going to be very, very difficult to detect the difference if, even though there is. Do you get it? Okay, so based on this idea, I, I, I just looked at what kind of placebo adjusted differences have been observed in all those six indications for which the original influx map was approved for. As you can see, rheumatoid arthritis was the, or is the area, where the smallest placebo-adjusted reference, I mean, placebo-adjusted efficacy between the reference has been found. But Ramsima was primarily studied, studied in this indication. So I don't think, basically, it did not meet the first criteria because rheumatoid arthritis is not a sensitive enough clinical model. You know, number two, same mechanism of action and same receptors. We all understand that Infliximab and other TNF-alpha inhibitors are attacking TNF-alpha. And that's how they got their name, TNF-alpha blockers. But is antagonizing TNF-alpha the only mechanism of action? If it is, we do not understand why Infliximab is efficacious in Crohn's disease in other IBD patients. But etanercept is not. For example, Infliximab is on your left. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fool. I mean, it's, it's a 
complete uh, map monoclonal, monoclonal antibody. And actually, those fat portions are binding TNF alpha. If you look at Tanacept, it's a hybrid fusion protein, you know, FC and TNF alpha receptors are attached to F the FC por portion. So basically, they are attaching the same, same receptor, which is TNF alpha. Then why infliximin is F efficacious in Crohn's disease and etanostep is not? We don't understand. Well, actually, if you look at uh, more data, infliximab, but now etanostep induces T cell ap apoptosis in Crohn's disease. For example, if you look at the left hand, and both are the same, but if you look at here, uh, infliximab represents a solid suckers, they are inducing it, uh, apoptosis, but etanostep did not. But in patients with RA, even infliximab did not induce any apoptosis. So that means we do not understand much about the exact mechanism of action for those TNF alpha blockers. Although blocking or binding TNF alpha is the main mechanism, but there could be some other mechanisms uh, uh, existing or available, if you will. And that might be different from one indication to another. Particularly, FC is involved in the area of ADCC or antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, which is very important in uh, uh, innate uh, immunity. Uh, this data uh, were presented to the EMEA, and if you look at here, uh, with different uh, cells and different effector uh, cells for FC-based ADCC, there was a difference between uh, the original influx man and Remsima. But we do not know how significant that can be translated into the clinical domain. So basically we're looking at in vitro data. But anyway, this was why Remsima was less ADCC prone compared with infliximab. And Dr. Hong's slide uh, showed the difference. It was 5% versus 12%, so it's approximately half. And it was because uh, Health Canada initially did not grant extrapolated indications to IBD uh, for Remsima. But we do not know how that kind of subtle difference can translate into something that we can see in the clinical domain. But anyway, the safety and immunogenicity. Again, immunogenicity is the single most important topic in the area of biologics. So, anti-drug an antibody or, a or ADA is part of, or some of the, those ADAs are NAB, you know, neutralizing. So, uh, if, a, uh, if uh, the ADA or, or uh, anti-drug uh, antibody neutralizes the product and then the therapeutic effect may be lessened. And it also can diminish the product's clearing from the body, but actually the way that ADA uh, is uh, exerting its uh, effect on the pharmacokinetics of the drug is totally uh, different and complicated. So even though we are, we are able to generalize the, the observation, it's basically product specific. Anyway, those two things are very important in safety. And my question was then, again, Remsima was studied in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, but rheumatoid arthritis patients, were those patients were the most sensitive model in detecting any difference in the immunogenicity profile of Remsima or Remicade? So I just looked at. But the results were followed. In other words, the ADA prevalence was the highest, not in rheumatoid arthritis, but in patients with Crohn's disease, up to 60%, or in the followed by psoriasis. And actually, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, the uh, proportion of those subjects, those patients who develop eventually ADA positive, were only 10%. Why? Because in the indication of rheumatoid arthritis, infliximab, the original and uh, 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 I mean, Remicade, the original Infliximab, and Remsma as well, have to be used with methotrexate underlying. 
And that actually caused less immunogenic profile. So again, my question is, is RA the most sensitive CLCA model to detect any difference in immunogenicity? No, it wasn't. So reflecting that kind of uh, reasoning that I alluded to you, uh, most scientific congresses and societies were not quite happy with extrapolation indication, including ECO, European Crohn's and Colitis Organization. But uh, this slide also shows that uh, when uh, Ramsey was first approved, uh, and it was studied only in rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, IBD specialists, you know, uh, gastroenterologists, were not quite happy with that kind of situation. So they would not uh, be very willing to prescribe uh, Remsima <laughs> for their patients because uh, they, they did not have much confidence at that time. But I think it has changed, and it should, I think. Anyway, uh, Saltron, I think, uh, did a very nice job uh, to alle alleviate those kind of concerns uh, for extrapolation. So Saltron uh, has performed a study in patients with Crohn's disease, you know, the IBD indication. And uh, Professor Kim, uh, he's a very old friend of mine, uh, graciously, uh, graciously allowed me to use his uh, couple of slides that actually was uh, published and presented all this year. So basically what they did, uh, I'm sorry, um, what they did in the study, they just compared Remsima, I mean, infliximab by similar, original infliximab, which is Remicade, in patients with Crohn's disease, IBD indication, and they followed them up, up to 30 weeks at this point, and the 30 weeks data were presented. And if you look at patients, I mean, basically uh, green represents uh, CTP13, which is Remsima, uh, by similar infliximab, and INF stands for originally infliximab, Remicade. There was no difference in terms of uh, efficacy. The safety was almost the same. Didn't see any uh, problem with either infliximab or uh, Remicade. So finally, they did some kind of nice uh, statistical analysis. And uh, the differences uh, were, uh, I mean, uh, the confidence interval of those differences were, uh, I mean, it did fall entirely within the preset equivalent margin, uh, which is 20%, which I think is a little, little bit, a uh, little, little too, uh, too wide. But anyway, this uh, was uh, the equivalence margin in this uh, study, so it's fine. So basically what it shows that uh, clinically there is no difference between uh, the original influx map and its bisimilar remsimer in terms of safety and efficacy. But is that the end of the story? No, it's not. Norswiss trial is the, is the, uh, the Norwegian uh, government sponsored trial. And in Norway, for example, uh, for certain reasons, they have been very active in introducing mobile stimulus. Particularly, I think uh, it has something to do with the fact that uh, cost, re cost reduction, which, which I think is a good thing. But anyway, in the study, they selected Crohn's disease patients and other patients who have been on, who had been on Remicade, you know, it was the original, bio, uh, original influx map for longer than six months and then randomized those patients to receive either Remicade, you know, it was the original biosimilar or Remzima, I mean, original influx map or Remzima, uh, which is the uh, biosimilar to Remicade. And they followed them up to 52 weeks. And what they found uh, well, in the study, disease worsening was the primary endpoint. As you can see in the slide, there was no difference. Slight difference, okay? But almost no difference. But if you look at the subgroups uh, enrolled in this study, the disease population consists of mostly uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And if you particularly look at Crohn's disease, I mean, disease worsening at 20, uh, 52 weeks after treatment, uh, it was way higher for Remsima. I do not know why this kind of data has been collected. Maybe uh, uh, if we, I mean, if they uh, uh, maintain and uh, if they keep uh, following them up more than two, uh, 52 weeks, they might come up with, uh, with an answer to this kind of weird observation, but this is data. I mean, data is data. 
So, extrapolation. The conclusion for extrapolation at this point is that the jury is still out. I, I do not know if you understand what this English sentence means. Basically, it means that it has not been determined yet. Okay? So, ECO, they revised their previously pre, uh, published position statement on the use of biosimilar in patients with IBD, inf uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. Well, it looks like they were, uh, they changed their mind. In other words, in the original position uh, statement, they were very strong, negative against the extrapolation of indication, particularly in patients with I IBD. But in this position statement, they changed, they mitigate their strong stance, but still, they warn extrapolation of indication can, cannot, cannot be an automatic or systematic conclusion. So their position is still, extrapolation should be decided on a case-by-case -case approach. So ladies and gentlemen, this is my last slide. This is my take-home message. It's absolutely fine. I'm okay with extrapolation because every country has its own jurisdiction. In other words, um, Korean FDA can say this, US FDA can say that. It's fine. But when it comes to clinical word, uh, marketing approval or rate approval does not necessarily mean that it's okay you to prescribe by similar without noticing the uniqueness of biologics, including biosimilar, and also the subtle but still um, important ish around extrapolation of indications, particularly the appropriateness of extrapolation across unstudied indications. By that, I want to conclude my presentation. I'm more than happy to entertain whatever questions that you might have. Thank you.